Paul, tr traditionally when we want to explain reality, explain existence, a passion I've had, uh, generally it's two camps. It's the, the theistic view of some kind of God or deep um, religious meaning to the world, uh, or it's a purely naturalistic, uh, materialistic one where the universe is there and there's really no purpose whatsoever. You've talked about not purpose, but the universe being about something, which um, which is a strange position. It's neither one. Um, uh, help me to understand what that means, why you think that way, and uh, all the criticism that you get because of it. <laughs> well, first of all, I specialize in being strange. You know, that's what I do. Um, uh, let me make this following point. So religion was the first attempt by human beings to make sense of their world. And then science was the next great attempt. And the assumption is, well, that's all there is. That's all we've got. We, we just take these two different worldviews. But why can't there be others? Uh, maybe in 10,000 years, there'd be a completely different way that we haven't thought of yet of looking at the world and making sense of it. So the first thing is that the job isn't done by just saying, well, you, uh, you pays your money and takes your choice between these, uh, these two camps. So I've always tried to, uh, to, to rise above that, to try to chart some new way of looking at things. And uh, in a nutshell, I think, uh, the religious view uh, says, well, God created the universe for a reason, and we're part of that reason. Uh, the scientific view is it's just sort of there, it doesn't have a reason or a purpose, and we just get on with the job of exploring it, and we uh, not only don't worry about whether there's a purpose, we deny that it even exists or that it's even meaningful. And that we're an accident in that whole uh, right, lack right. of purpose. And so uh, what I feel is, well, look, you know, both camps have something to offer, whilst we're struggling to construct yet another way of, uh, I don't know, post-religious, post-scientific view, which still offers some sense. It's not anti-religious, anti-scientific. It's taking the elements of those. That, don't forget that a lot of the scientific worldview is, in fact, a derivative of the theistic worldview. It uh, took a lot of concepts out of theology. So there's a lot of common ground to start off with. Uh, and so I just see it's not so much a, a matter of occupying the middle ground, but of, of trying to, to break through to a, a higher level, a better way of tackling these things, because I just get bored with this sterile, you know, is there a God, there isn't a God. I just think it's uh, after a whole career of, of listening to that, that we can do better. I'm trying to find a set of concepts, and this aboutness thing is my attempt to just elevate the debate to a higher level. And I struggle to do that, because I think uh, I, I tend to be condemned by both sides because uh, any, any mention of, you know, that the universe is about something looks like purpose. Oh, this is a way of smuggling in God. Mm. Uh, but if you say, well, I don't believe in a, in a God or a pre-existing being or a cosmic magician and miracles and all that mm. stuff, I reject all that stuff. Um, but, you know, I think the universe is about something. Well, that looks very wishy-washy uh, to... A, a standard believer, mm -hmm. but but that's okay. I'm trying to do something new, and and I think to do something new, you have to bring in a new conceptual framework. We try and build it on the old concepts, so we get back to the same old problems. Okay, so if the universe is about something, giving you this this new way of talking about it and see what we can do, um, a, a word that comes to my mind is teleology. Right. Uh, that there is a purpose, there is a goal, and yes. at least in, in, in our current world, teleology is a, is a dirty word. That's right, and I think uh, it's time that we uh, dusted it off and looked at it again. Uh, where uh, teleology got into trouble was in the theory of evolution, the idea that, uh, that evolution was being guided towards or guiding itself towards some specific goal. And it's usual to say, well, nature is blind and that it can't look ahead and that life mm -hmm. does just what it can do best at the time. Uh, and I, I don't deny uh, Darwinian evolution. Uh, but if you stand back and look at the universe uh, through the eyes of a cosmologist and say, well, what's the story of the universe? A hundred years ago, the story was that the universe began uh, in some sort of ordered state and is sliding towards a maximum entropy state of disorder. But now, with modern cosmology, we see it rather differently. The, the universe began in a rather bland and uninteresting state in the Big Bang, and it's developed more complexity and richness over time, and it may go on doing that. So there's a sort of directionality uh, to it, and we struggle to grasp exactly how to quantify that, but most people sort of accept that it's so. Uh, and then we can talk again about 
the far future of the universe and what its ultimate uh, destination might be. But all of this uh, strikes me as being not just an arbitrary unfolding of meaningless stuff. It, it looks much more like something which is, uh, there's an agenda. Uh, now, when I say agenda, okay. you think, oh, there was a pre-existing being who, could, who had in mind uh, what might happen, and that's not what I'm after at all. Uh, and I come back to this point that I've made, which I think is an important part of this, that, that human beings, through the scientific method and, and the exercise of reasoning, um, they've, they're products of nature, they've come out of nature, and they have the capacity to link in to nature through science and mathematics at a very fundamental level. We can decode nature, and that means that human existence and cosmic existence are linked. So uh, the closest thing I can say, uh, if you ask me, what do you mean about something, that, that's what I'm referring to. That's the, the most um, uh, obvious and manifest example that it's not arbitrary and it's not disconnected. Our existence is not disconnected. So you're privileging consciousness in a sense in this universal history even though human consciousness may be only a few tens or hundreds of thousands of years old depending on how you define right. it. It's come out of the universe. That's come right. It the wasn't universe. there at the beginning. Right. You see. So that's why I say it's about something because there's a directionality Most which is given rise. Most scientists say that's, that's just a pure accident of evolution. Uh, well, I don't deny that there are accidents along the way, uh, but we come back to the, the, the T word, te teleology, uh, that if uh, overall there is a, a scheme or a structure or a constraint in the way that the universe is evolving, it's uh, entirely uh, reasonable, it seems to me, that this uh, includes the emergence of life and mind. And it's very, very curious, because my scientific colleagues, um, when, when I was a student, uh, they... Uh, use that type of reasoning to say there couldn't possibly be any life anywhere else. It's obviously a bizarre fluke. Now, these people are rushing to say, oh, the universe is teeming with life. It's sort of inevitable. Well, if life is inevitable, why can't mind be inevitable? Why can't comprehension be inevitable? Uh, so they've, they've already gone the major step in saying that the emergence of life is built into the nature of things. Why can't the emergence of mind be built into the nature of things?